all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We also want to thank Eisenhower Center. It's a brain injury recovery center. Learn more about eisenhowercenter.com. They're located in Michigan and in Florida. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. Contact us if you'd like to be a sponsor on Veterans Radio, and let's move on to our program. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today uh, Vice Admiral Sandy Stowes. Uh, the Vice Admiral is a retired United States Coast Guard, uh, 36 years, I believe, in service. Uh, Admiral, welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, good. Hello, Jim. It's great to be here with Veterans Radio. I'm honored to be on your podcast today. Well, it's a real honor to have uh, somebody who has served the country as long as you have, uh, somebody who from the Coast Guard, which, as I mentioned uh, when we were setting this up, is always hard to find. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. But let's set this up a little bit about how a nice girl like you from uh, Maryland, a small town in Maryland, ended up at the uh, Coast Guard Academy. Oh, that's a great story. Thank you for asking, because I think it is something that can inspire people uh, who are looking to find what their passion and purpose is. And there's so much to choose from. And especially with today's youth, I think they really have a lot of challenges because there's so much out there and uh, there's uh, so much uh, um, interference with uh, what they're trying to do with their education. Look at the COVID, trying to prepare themselves for the future. So we all meet challenges depending on where we are in our lives. And back when I was a young girl, it was in the 1960s and 70s. I was born in 1960 for context. And the opportunities that came my way that kind of canceled out some of the challenges were that in 1972, you had Title IX that was passed, which gave equal opportunity in education for girls. So that was sports and and studies. And then following on the heels of that was 1973, the Equal Rights Amendment. So by the time I got into high school in 1976, we had that legislation that opened doors for girls in high school to play sports and have assigned coaches. And that was so important to me. I was uh, an athletic kid, but I was shy and and unconfident uh, as a young girl. And sports helped me to build my confidence, and as, as did uh, competing in academics and having good classes uh, that I could go to. I was born and raised in Ellicott City, Maryland, which is near Annapolis, where the Naval Academy is. And in nineteen. Um, I actually, I'm, I made a mistake earlier. I said I entered high school in 76. I entered high school in 74, but in 1976, that was a seminal year for me. I was a junior in high school, and the National Defense Authorization Act had required that all the service academies open their doors to women. So that includes the Naval Academy that was right next door to me, the uh, uh, West Point, the Military Academy up in West Point, the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, and uh, the Merchant Marine Academy out in Kings Point, Coast Guard Academy, of course, in New London, Connecticut. 
So I applied to the Naval Academy, this new opportunity that had never been available to to women and girls uh, up until that time, uh, thinking it would be a great chance for adventure and to serve my country. And oh, by the way, it was a free education. And in those days, that was rare. So that's, uh, a, you know, the, um, the several minute version of uh, what could be, if you read my book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, that's a uh, a 300 page book, but a little tiny bit of what what happened uh, along the way that gave me opportunities to get into a program, the Coast Guard Academy, that um, helped test me and helped me to achieve my full potential. And I didn't say why. I don't know how much time I should spend, but I did go to the Coast Guard Academy instead of the Naval Academy. And I guess, uh, Jim, if it's okay, I'll just uh, take a little tack on that. Go ahead. Because I did, a, I did apply right to the Naval Academy because that was right next door and I had my heart set on it. But I guess it's an important part of the story that a guidance counselor, so when you're young, you're looking to your coaches, your teachers, your guidance counselors, your parents as role models and mentors to help guide you into what is a good outcome. So my guidance counselor, PJ, said, Sandy, you should cast a wider net and not just put all your eggs in one basket in the Naval Academy. And I'm like, well, PJ, I want to go to the Naval Academy. And he says, well... I got this flyer in the mail from a thing called the Coast Guard Academy, and let's take a look at that. So I poured over that flyer, and uh, we decided wrong way, but at the time we decided it must be a small Navy. So, okay, I'll apply there too. (laughs) (laughs) And and I heard back from the Coast Guard quickly because we are a direct admit. We don't have to go through congressional nomination. And that's, at that's, an, Academy. that's an important point, and it is today. Still in that way, you can get in directly to the Coast Guard Academy. You don't need your congressman or your senator to, to uh, appoint you, and that has a, a lot of advantages to people even today, I believe. And really, I'm glad you mentioned that, and I'm glad you gave me a chance to go back to this, why I picked the Coast Guard over the Navy. And it, it was true. We are under Title 14 of the U.S. Code instead of Title 10, so we are direct admit. And you get in on your merits. And I really thought that was important to me because I my core values as a young girl were hard work, perseverance, humility, honesty, all those things that, that you know, angled towards you get in based on how well you do, not who you know. And I was shy. I wasn't out there, you know, partying with everybody, knowing all these important people that could refer me to congressional nominations. So when I got into the Coast Guard, I um, into the academy, some of the cadets went on exchange programs. All the academies have this exchange program. And the um, women who went down to the Naval Academy, well, all the cadets that went to the Naval Academy, they came back saying, wow, women at the Naval Academy can't do, they can't, when they graduate, they have to go into support roles. They can't go out onto combat ships, frigates and destroyers, submarines, uh, aircraft. And in the Coast Guard, our commandant said, hey, if we're going to admit women, they're going to do every job. So in 1979, as a cadet, I was on a summer cruise on the Coast Guard Cutter Dallas, a 378-foot high-endurance cutter. And it's, at some point in time, those ships were armed with Harpoon and Sea Whiz missile systems. I'm not sure if they were when I was on board, but I was not precluded from sailing on the Coast Guard's ships, even if they were outfitted as a, a warship. Um, the Coast Guard made the decision to let women serve in every position, and we were equal because of that. And I firmly believe we faced a lot less um, discrimination or or bias because we were able to do every job men could do. Well, and as further evidence of the Coast Guard's kind of leading the way here, um, uh, Vice Admiral Sandy Stowe's uh, ended up being also uh, the first woman to lead a U.S. Armed Forces Service Academy when she returned to the Coast Guard Academy in New London and was its superintendent uh, during her distinguished career. But let me back up, Sandy. I, I want to I want to touch on a couple of things quickly because I want folks to get more of a sense of the background here. Um, you know, you, you often find folks going to the military because of family history, and that really wasn't the case here. And I found the family history of your grandparents on both sides kind of interesting, that one set of grandparents had come from Romania, they had a farm, and they really worked hard. And, and that's part of your core values was that, you know, hard work, as you said a, a moment ago. And another set of uh, grandparents lived up on Cape Cod, 
and had a real exposure to um, the, the water and sailing. And in some way, both of those grandparents certainly molded and made you part of the person you were going into uh, the Coast Guard Academy, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. I go back to that importance of role models in a young person's life when they're developing their character and core values. And that is your foundation for the rest of your life. And it helps you to be able to make good choices and good decisions. And like I said earlier, that's so important for our youth today with amid so many choices and options. How do you steer a straight course and keep your core values, be true to your to what's right and do the right thing even when it's easier to do something wrong. So I took so much of my grandparents' values um, from the summers that I spent with them. And especially at the at the beach, I guess, because we're talking about how I got into the Coast Guard Academy and how I had no relatives that served in the armed forces. Um, I got a liking for the sea and its lure there in Falmouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod, visiting my grandparents there during the summers. And I just love the freedom of being at sea in a rowboat. <laughs> my granddad had an old rowboat. He'd row us around the bay that they that they lived on. And um, it was simple, humble times. Well, and but I think <laughs> I think that's really comes through in your book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters, is you kind of get a sense that, and it, and it fits into your leadership views on uh, on mentors and you maybe don't think of parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts as being mentors but certainly that's what they were for you as you were growing up and and you may be the only admiral who ever spent summers picking cucumbers and tobacco on the farm <laughs> and, and and again I, I i point that out to help folks understand where you come from um and and how you approach this and your honesty in the book of saying at the Coast Guard Academy, you know, you were an average cadet and a below average ac- academically, um, <laughs> but you took everything and applied it diligently. And and preparation and performance and perseverance, um, those four three Ps added up to success in the way you put your math together, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. And and I think this is important because I was very intentional when I wrote this book of starting with my humble beginnings as a shy young person who worked hard, who didn't have any advantages in life and had to make it on my own, so to speak, which is why I was working at the age of 13. During the 1970s, we had the oil shock and there were no jobs and the future was a little bit bleak for going to college or going on after high school. So the the farm work gave me um, an opportunity to um, really get to know more about who I was and what I was capable of. And uh, that all uh, was important qualities and values when I got into the Coast Guard and at the academy and found out I was very average because in high school I had done well. <laughs> I was near the top of my class. And, and when it comes down to it, though, most of us are in the average category. Amen. And I wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to start humble in my book as a young person because if people just saw a book by an admiral, Admiral Stowe's, um, and I started out at the executive level, they would be like, well, I could never get there. Why should I read this book? Because I'm never going to be able to be who she is. And I'm like, no, I started way down here and 40 years later, because I was 40 years with the Coast Guard, 36 years active duty, but four years of the academy. So I would tell cadets, you know, You've got to take it one day at a time, one week at a time, one assignment at a time. You're not going to be an admiral for a long time. And that's okay because it's the journey that matters. Average people are going to get on this journey and they're going to go through these uncharted waters with the icebergs they've got to go around, the ice they've got to plow through, the obstacles they've got to overcome. And the average person can become um, above average by work, by hard work and perseverance and um, being true to themselves and sticking with it. Well, one of the things that I also think um, in a in a career like yours, and, and really any service career, but in a, in a naval service, you kind of start at the bottom, you're an ensign, 
you get the you get the crummy assignments you get the crummy watches you hope to make a deck officer you move your way up to to maybe an ops officer and then maybe you're going to get to be the executive officer on a smaller ship and someday a commanding officer on a bigger ship and in your instance uh, you spent six years straight at sea duty in the beginning and, and, and through your career you spent 12 years at, at sea there's no way to cover all of that but i I guess I guess I want you to give folks some sense of some of those C assignments and and maybe talk a little bit about nobody ever thinks they're going to be a lifer and spend twelve years at sea. So how does this how does this happen? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a good another good little um, tidbit there. I when looking back on my career, like when I was writing the book, and even when I got to be a senior officer, looking back on my career, I I, I just had had convinced myself, uh, I just grown to believe that I'd always expected to be um, a lifer. I use your words. I never use that word, but to use your word, a lifer. <laughs> and then I, um, when I made superintendent, when I came back to be superintendent at the Coast Guard Academy in 2011, I was an admiral, uh, well, a rear admiral. And a girlfriend of mine, a high school classmate, sent me an article the Baltimore Sun had written on, on me when I was a cadet. And I was maybe like a um, junior cadet, so three years in, and they sent a reporter up, how, how are the Maryland cadets doing up here at the academy? And they interviewed me, and, I, and they asked me, well, do you think you'll stay in the Coast Guard? And there's a five-year obligated service requirement for all the service academies, so that when you come out, you pay back for what you had for a free education. Nothing's free. <laughs> and um, I said in that article, well, I don't know. I'm reading my own words. Well, I'm not <laughs> sure. I'll see how it goes and um, and do my five years and see. And I'm like, I said that? I'm reading this now in 2011. I always knew I was going to stay in the Coast Guard for a whole career. This must be wrong. But it wasn't. That's how I thought at the time. But I had convinced myself. And I didn't even try. I just loved the Coast Guard. So I just presumed in my mind that I'd always felt that way. But for young people, you were going to think about what you're doing and wonder if you're going to stick with it. You're going to have your doubts. You're not going to know. And you need to be comfortable with that uncertainty because we live in a world of uncertainty and challenge. So as people navigate these uncharted waters, they just have to keep focused on the fact that that um, they're going to go through and it doesn't matter if they stay with the same occupation. So getting back to your question, I wanted to start with that anecdote because it shows how I wasn't sure when I was young if I was going to make a career of it. And then I did 12 years at sea and ended up staying all the way until the until I had to retire <laughs> for time and service reasons. But I, I went off to those first six years of sea duty and had no idea it was going to be six years. Um, I always loved being at sea. I loved the sailing when I was a cadet and the summer cruises. And I went off and my first ship was an icebreaker, a polar icebreaker going to the Antarctic. And what, how much better can it be than that? So I get on the ship and we sail down to the South Pacific. We stop in, um, what was the first place? Apia, Western Samoa. We go to New Zealand. We go into the ice to Antarctica. I get to experience all that. And that's all in my book. And then I went to the Polar Star, another icebreaker. And I was loving the adventure, the people, the opportunity to be part of great missions that people would never know existed. Like, who knows what's going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic? But I was learning all that, and I was becoming confident and capable in my occupation. And how fulfilling and satisfying for somebody who started out shy, unconfident, to become good at what you're doing and to be able to stand tall on the bridge of that ship, being a qualified deck watch officer eventually. And so then I went on to another ship and I only went ashore when the detail or the assignment officer told me I had to. But then I loved the shore jobs and I found that anywhere I was assigned, regardless of how remote it sounded or how what headquarters, it must be the kiss of death. That's like the Pentagon to the other services. <laughs> and in fact, they were all wonderful opportunities. Why? Because I chose to see an opportunity instead of a challenge. Boom. There's, there's, there's the knowledge bomb right there. Everybody stop. <laughs> it really is. If you choose to see that as an opportunity, hey, I'm going to go to headquarters. I'm going to be the chief, uh, chief of staff's aide 
it's a pressure cooker. I'm going to find myself cutting budgets and people or involved in purchasing. I mean, these are heavyweight jobs. But if you if you accept them as a great opportunity to learn and do something good, then it's a great assignment. You never know if a bad assignment is going to be a good assignment. And that's true in the civilian life as well. So I, I think you explained that uh, well in the book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, uh, Admiral. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's all a matter of experience. It's hard to tell young people this, and we all have to experience it. But I hope that the book and, and this podcast will help people understand everybody's average. You start from somewhere, and you work your way up. You work hard, you persevere, and you look for the opportunities amidst the many challenges that you're going to face. Well, I think I think you all, you had a, I wrote this down, put quotes around it, because I thought it captured the the concern many of us have right in life when we are quote, quietly competent, close quote, where people don't, you know, may, maybe we're not the brashest one in the room. Maybe we're not the best backslapper. We're just going along, our, doing our business, and we're, we're doing it well. We're quietly competent. And you talk about that as sort of a phase there or, or, or an area where you kind of grow. Your, as your confidence grows, you kind of grow into more than being quietly competent. It's an interesting idea. Yes, and this book, I'm an introvert, um, a classic introvert, if you look at the what that means, which it really means that you recharge yourself by your solitude as opposed to recharging yourself at the after party that everyone else is going to. But anyway, a lot of people who are introverts have commended me on the book and said, yeah, I can see myself in that. Because a lot of times the people who are rewarded wherever we are in life, whether it's the first grade classroom (laughs) or the sports field or the business room, boardroom, it's the louder people who push their hand up or who jump forward and are always filling the room with their presence. And then the quietly competent person sitting there waiting to be called on is the one who might have all the best ideas, but never get a chance to to raise those ideas. So a good leader is going to look for the look around that table, look around that that sports field, playing field, look around the classroom, and they're going to call on people who don't seem to to put themselves forward. And then by calling on them, they usually often you'll find those people have the right answer. They're just afraid to to speak up. And then they develop their confidence. And then you've got a stronger team. And this is a leadership book, um, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, uh, Leading in Uncharted Waters by Vice Admiral Sandy Stowes. But I don't want to scare folks off because I don't need a leadership book. I I saw this more as a, uh, a, a book that also told you a lot about how to how to grow in your own life. And, and uh, it's, although she has a master's of business uh, administration from Northwestern University, and she has a master of national security strategy from the National War College, um, and she was a superintendent or, or a college president, if you will, of the Coast Guard Academy, there is a little bit of a lower brow uh, uh, leadership advice that I could relate to here when, uh, when you refer to Kung Fu Panda. Tell us a little... <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on uh, that as a leadership or or growth uh, uh, opportunity. Well, first, I'm going to tell you a a tiny little anecdote that starts this story. I was superintendent at the Coast Guard Academy 2011. So it must have been 2012 or so. I'm standing in front of a bunch of cadets, brand new cadets, which is students at, at a service academy. And so they're 18, 19 years old. And um, so I'm trying to tell a story that's in my book, in fact, about how my boss wanted to be, wanted me to be confident. He wanted me to stand on the bridge of a ship like John Wayne with a six gun in each hand barking orders. And so I tell that story to the cadets because I was trying to relate to them saying, hey, I know you're all in this new environment. You don't, you know, project yourself. Maybe you're kind of shy. Um, but you can overcome it. And so I used the John Wayne story. And then I thought, I just thought of something. It kind of came to me. I said, wait a minute. How many in you, how many of you have heard of John Wayne? A couple of hands went slowly <laughs> up. <laughs> you, you were dating yourself. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I'm here to tell you for four years, I listened to speakers my age, incredibly famous people in some cases, come in and use anecdotes the cadets had never heard of because they were used to speaking to older audiences. So I'm like, oh my gosh, 
I've got to come up with something new. So I had recently watched Kung Fu Panda and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's leadership lessons in every scene of Kung Fu Panda. And so I even have a little talk that's the 10 leadership lessons from Kung Fu Panda. But I was able to use that for, for people because you take this Kung Fu Panda and it's not that old. So people listening in today probably have seen either the first one or the second one or both. And you got a big fat panda who's doing nothing with his life. He's just working in his father's restaurant and he dreams of being the Kung Fu warrior. Well, the Kung Fu warrior doesn't look anything like a big fat panda, of course. It's a much more, you know, physically fit and capable specimen, but he has this dream. And then all of a sudden one day, there's a magic moment where every year there's one person picked for to be the next Kung Fu warrior. And this guy's picked, Poe, the fat panda. It's just like a magical thing and nobody can believe it because he can't do anything. And so this master, this Kung Fu master has to train him and there's other Kung Fu warriors in the group and they all look down on him. They pick on him. They mock him. And they, he's too fat, he's too jovial, he doesn't fit in. Well, in the end, all these qualities that people have been mocking him for were strengths. And he was able to defeat the foe that he was having to meet by believing in himself and who he was. And there's a scene that I always remember in the movie where they've done all they can with training this kung fu panda this fat po to be the kung fu warrior and they're at their wits end but they've done everything the last thing is a secret scroll at the top of the palace and you can only get it with a big ladder and a hook and you bring it down and the only person that can read the secret scroll that has the recipe for how to beat this bad foe that's going to come destroy the village the only person that can read that is the kung fu warrior so they hand big fat po the scroll and he unravels it thinking there's going to be the secret, you know, the secret sauce, how he's going to beat this foe. And he just screams and, and falls back. And all it is is a reflective paper that shows his big fat panda face. He's looking at himself. And that's like the moment for me. It's in you. It's all about it's already in there. So how do each of us as individuals bring out the best of us that's ready to go out and fight and uh, win it's a great leadership <laughs> principle because it is look within it's there you just yeah. have to bring it out and it ties in we'll t tie this up with a ribbon here so remind us what the coast guard motto is semper Pred is always ready and there you go right <laughs> look within be prepared and always be ready um and you you talk about always showing up early for watch always being ready uh, to, to assume command because you've done preparatory work before you walk onto the bridge. Um, and, and again, one of those life lessons you learn in the military that is going to help you in leading, uh, whether it's your uh, family or at work or wherever it might be. So breaking ice and breaking glass, leading in uncharted waters is absolutely worth the read. Don't think it's too highbrow for you. <laughs> uh, don't think you won't get anything out of it because you can't relate because Sandy's very relatable in, in uh, this book. And with your permission, Admiral, I'd like to move to a couple of other uh, topics. Absolutely. So we, there are, you know, it's a great opportunity to talk to somebody who's been at headquarters at the U.S. Coast Guard, um, who's run the academy, who's had such a distinguished career to talk about three or four areas here. One I want to get some view on, because I don't think we hear, hear enough in the general press and, and uh, in general on how is the United States Coast Guard's being treated as it relates to congressional budget and staffing and shipbuilding. We hear about the Navy needing more ships to be built in a specific number, but I couldn't tell you how many ships the Coast Guard has or what the right number even is supposed to be, according to the experts. Give us some insight. That's a really good question, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about our, our beloved Coast Guard. And, you know, generally speaking, and I've been in a lot of roles in the Coast Guard that have um, responsibilities with program uh, management and everything, presenting budgets and programs to the Hill, the Coast Guard's usually um, most often treated well as far as people love the Coast Guard. 
Um, everybody likes the Coast Guard. And you talk about these great missions we've got. Who wouldn't like an organization that does search and rescue, <laughs> you know, law enforcement, ice breaking? We're out there everywhere. We're partnering with the interagency. We're always ready, always reliable. We're efficient, proficient, and, and um, nice. <laughs> we've got great core values, but um, we're also small, and we don't... Um, ask for a lot. We don't pat ourselves on the back and we blend in. And so we we were lost in transportation. We were in transportation department many years ago because we got um, overwhelmed by the Federal Aviation Administration, railroads, highways, you know, all that. Then we moved over to Department of Homeland Security during after 9-11 and um, we're competing with Customs and Border Protection, ICE, TSA. <laughs> it's easy to see how the Coast Guard, which is always doing its job, never in trouble, and and um, you know, doing staying beneath the radar as far as attention goes. And because we're we're too successful, I would I would offer we don't get the attention because oftentimes congressional attention comes to fix big problems. And um, and as opposed to the DOD, we're just not in that same category of the committees. So because we're in the DHS, we're under a different committee for oversight. So once the Coast Guard was shifted over to DHS from DOT, they didn't give up. The transportation didn't give up oversight of the Coast Guard. So we still have to report to transportation subcommittees and to um, DHS subcommittees. And uh, we're aligned with DOD. So we're kind of spread so thin that we're like thin ice that, that doesn't have the enough weight to support uh, itself. And um, we are over um, in the South China Sea with our national security cutters, 418 feet. We're in the Persian Gulf with our fast response cutters that are over there protecting U.S. Navy assets. We are uh, in the Arctic and the Antarctic with national, with polar security cutters, but people don't realize that. We're stopping the threat at the point of origin by f pushing our forces overseas, serving right alongside our Navy counterparts, but that's not recognized or understood. So when the resources get spread around, we're not in the right committees and we're not uh, big enough to um, break through and get attention. Here in, in uh, 2021, is the, is the Coast Guard able to maintain full staffing? Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't, being retired for three years, be an expert on where we are with staffing. But I will tell you that when I was in my entire 40 career years in, in the Coast Guard, we did not have um, enough staffing to get the yeah. missions done that people want us to do. Yeah. And yeah. We, we're an organization that people want to add more missions to because we're so effective and so efficient. But we we work ourselves to death, and uh, and there's not enough people to get all the jobs done. Yeah, you hear you hear that in a lot of the services that you know, particularly, you know, not a, not enough of a certain MOS, or not enough pilots, or maybe not enough mechanics, or enough guys in ship, and and you know, it can be really hard to st in a volunteer way to to be fully staffed, but the importance of it can't be minimized, and similarly. It takes forever to build new ships. Um, I, I'm wondering how the age of the fleet is and, and what the what the lineup is going forward for uh, getting additional either replacement ships or new ships added to the fleet. Oh, well, in that respect, you know, and it's so, so hard to be on a podcast like this with just a few minutes and there being so much to cover because I just got done talking about how we kind of get lost in the Navy with our resourcing, but... On the other hand, look at what the Coast Guard's had for resourcing over the past five or 10 years. All of our um, high endurance cutters, those eight cutters that we had have been replaced and we're getting new national security cutters, 418 feet long, so incredibly capable. We're getting new polar security cutters to replace our old aging icebreakers. We've only got two icebreakers left. We've now um, got funding and some, some level of funding for uh, three of those icebreakers, um, and we hope to get more. We have all those fast response cutters I talked about, um, a fleet of uh, 
coming on close to about 50 of those, the ones that I talked about over in the Persian Gulf and all around the coast of America. And our aircraft have been recapitalized as far as major overhauls over the past number of years with brand new C-130 fixed wing aircraft. And we, I'd say the one area that we need capital assets the most, because we you can't have it all at once, right? So our ships and airplanes, the Congress has done great by us and the administration. And it does take forever and you can't do it all at once. But now it's our shore facilities and our infrastructure and our information technology infrastructure that's really lagging and that needs attention. You know, it's it's great to hear that the capital assets are being attended to because they're so important, particularly as the missions either evolve or get or new missions are kind of uh, added. Um, you spent a lot of time up uh, up in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, and we've really seen an evolving of the mission, I, I think. That's what I want your views on, um, particularly up uh, in the Arctic space with global warming. The Russians are making all kinds of noise up there. Um, how, how is the Coast Guard's mission evolving as it relates to the, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic? So for years and years and years, the Coast Guard and before the Coast Guard, the Navy had a presence in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And there were national security interests at both of those poles and still are. And um, they've evolved for a number of reasons. So in, in the Antarctic, I could talk about that, but you asked about the Arctic. In the Arctic, certainly it is the melting ice cap that has caused the renewed interest in um, national security uh, interests up there for not just the United States, but the other polar nations and those nations that aren't polar. <laughs> so there, there's a um, evolving commerce there's uh, evolving opportunities to um, to navigate and um, ship. I guess that's the same as, as the commerce, but you've got the tourism, you've got all kinds of um, possibly lucrative activities that could go on. If you could find a, um, a way across the Northwest Passage, you could save time, ships could save time, uh, as opposed to going through the Panama Canal. So there's a lot of reasons that people are looking at trying to um, adjudicate that that currently peaceful space up there, and I think the Arctic's been peaceful for ever, and we want to keep it that way. So there's a lot of good going on with um, leadership in the in the Arctic, and uh, we've got a coalition of eight Arctic states and 13 non-Arctic states that form the Arctic Council which is a very effective body, which is looking at all manner of um, issues that involve indigenous people, focus on climate change, rules for sustainable economic development, those kind of things. And the U.S. is a real leader in that body. And you've also got um, an Arctic Coast Guard forum where the, the Coast Guards, uh, especially our U.S. Coast Guard, are um, leading the way in the Arctic to de-escalate tensions and to keep it peaceful. So a lot of our national security presence in the Arctic is focused on keeping the peace and making sure that uh, that um, geographic area um, is, is uh, secure and um, is, is uh, well um, adjudicated for everybody, all countries with, with interests up there. Well, and I think it's easy for our veteran radio listeners maybe to have lost sight of how expansive the Coast Guard's mission is today. And we're talking to Vice Admiral Sandy Stowe's retired from the United States Coast Guard. She, her leadership book out is Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, and she's giving us some of her personal views on um, these evolving missions. And I guess I had not really thought about the Coast Guard being in the Persian Gulf Tell us a little bit about what it's doing there. Well, we've been um, over there in different forms for a number of years, ever since Desert Storm back in 1990, when the Coast Guard had port security units deployed. And those are our reserve units. So the Coast Guard, military force, we have a reserve component, like all the other branches of the military. And Coast Guard reserves, they are great. I used to be director of reserve uh, when I was in. In active duty as an admiral, 
And we have wonderful people who are trained to deploy on a moment's notice, as with the other services. And we have great authorities that enable us to to get out ahead of uh, um, the other services in some cases for for national disasters like Hurricane Katrina. Going overseas, uh, we deployed our reserves like the other services did and were a presence over there during Desert Storm and through all the way up to the uh, more current um, operations. Now we don't have our, I believe, our port security units over there anymore, but we have patrol forces southwest Asia that uh, are eight patrol boats that are serving. I think it's eight. <laughs> don't quote me on that. It's either six or eight. <laughs> Three years retired and you forget. But um, <laughs> those boats are over there maintaining a presence in the Persian Gulf. At one time, they were protecting the um, oil terminals. Um, they protect the Navy ships over there, provide a presence uh, that uh, is, is designed to deter the aggressors in that region. And uh, it's a great mission. It's a joint mission. Um, we work very closely with the, the Navy over there. And uh, it's a great opportunity for Coast Guard people to serve in, in joint roles. We do a lot of interagency within the Department of Homeland Security. And it's not a chance for us to serve in a joint environment with our Navy and other service brethren. Well, there's one more uh, ex- mission that I think is going to be expanding for the Coast Guard. Um, you, you read a little bit about it, but uh, again, this is one of those areas where the, the Coast Guard kind of doesn't get maybe enough uh, recognition or, or ink uh, in the newspapers. Uh, and that would be over uh, in the South China Sea, um, so, sort of keeping navigable waterways open, international waterways, and you know some of the pressure that China's putting on that, uh, on that issue. How is the Coast Guard's mission over in the South China Sea changing? Well, we've been deploying over there for many years. We've had our 378-foot cutters um, doing exercises with the Navy um, for as long as I can remember. Um, and that mission is expanding now, and Coast Guard's doing more independent operations over the past few years. And that is partly because we're using our presence in a different way. So the Coast Guard's not the Navy. We're not a Greyhound ship. We're not a combatant. We're a Coast Guard cutter. So we're able to be over in those disputed areas um, in the capacity of our military maritime multi-mission role. So we're doing law enforcement, uh, fishers enforcement. We're doing um, 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 national security presence in, 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 from a different perspective. And there's a more um, uh, peaceful perspective there and mission-focused perspective on on other missions besides national defense. So even though the Coast Guard does have that as part of its portfolio, we also are able to come across in a softer manner. So I would say it's a kind of a softer power that we're smart to be deploying. Well, it's important to project power in a, a lot of different ways. And as you say, this allows it to be projected in a different way, but still important. Um, it, it also highlights, and we've just covered the world, I think, um, the the really tremendous missions of the Coast Guard from the Arctic to the Antarctic, from the Persian Gulf to the South China Sea, all along the United States coastline, the, the Great Lakes. Um, uh, so it, it, I, I can see how you found it a fascinating career and someplace you wanted to spend 40 years in, and we're talking to uh, Vice Admiral Sandy Stos, of the retired from the United States Coast Guard Academy. Her new book out is Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters. And uh, Admiral, I really appreciate you taking some time and some extra time today with uh, Veterans Radio to uh, talk about the world and talk about the Coast Guard. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jim, for giving me the opportunity. I wish I was more up to date on some of these issues. And boy, there are Coast Guard uh, members who are the experts in these areas of our international operations. I mean, I know that, you know, our 
one of our cutters was over in the Black Sea, and we've been over to Africa and down into South America. So there's a great story to tell there. I'm not the expert for all those details, but at least maybe your readers, your listeners get a little taste of um, a thought of the Coast Guard beyond what they see when they look out their window, which might be an orange Coast Guard helicopter flying by or the Coast Guard rescue boat at the surf station. Uh, Maybe your listeners will have a better understanding of the um, range and reach of the U.S. Coast Guard and our our inner relations with uh, the DOD and the DHS. And there's more to explore there for future topics. Absolutely. And we hope that as they hear these stories, they think, you know, uh, hey, maybe my niece or nephew or grandson or granddaughter or uh, son or daughter, uh, maybe they ought to explore a career in the U.S. Coast Guard. It sounds a hell of a lot more interesting than I thought it was going to be. So, <laughs> you know, that's part of part of why we tell these stories, because you only know what you get exposed to. And we're hoping we're exposing folks to a bigger uh, a, a, a bigger swath of what the United States Coast Guard is is all about. And Sandy, we appreciate your time and your offer to uh, line us up with some of those other experts for future future conversations. Absolutely, and I hope that everybody listening will recommend uh, to somebody, to some young person, that they join the Coast Guard, enlist, um, join as an officer. It's a wonderful organization with great core values. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Jim. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, You are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, Eisenhower Center. VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. They keep us on the air, as does your support. Go to Facebook, go to veteransradio.net, and support our efforts. And until next time, you are dismissed. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.